morning. My name is, good morning. My name is Becky, and it is my joy uh, to be able to welcome you to church this morning. And if you're joining us online this morning, I just want to thank you for taking time to tune in. Um, we are so glad that you're also here with us today. Um, we have a special, special morning for you. Uh, we have Pastor Mark Anderson here uh, this morning from Royal City Mission, and he will be doing a four-week sermon series uh, for us uh, in the parables for, about the parables of Jesus, which is really exciting. Um, so we'll be introducing him a little bit later on in the service. If you are a kid joining us for worship, we are so glad that you are here. Have fun. We hope you enjoy the songs. Uh, we'll be dismissing you right before the sermon. Um, and if you are a new family and you need some extra space or you want, uh, you need a moment to recharge, we do have a parents' lounge, and that is located just down the hall. And there's some chairs there. You can just make yourself comfortable and come in and out as you need to. We like to use this moment to uh, quiet our minds before the service. Uh, it can be always a little bit chaotic coming in. And that concept of quieting our minds, um, I have a very distinct memory of this growing up. So I am the youngest of four kids. And as you can imagine, Sunday mornings were always a little crazy, getting dressed and getting out the door and being fed. And we're a bit rambunctious in the van coming here. and. Um, we, would, we would get to uh, church, we would kind of slide on into the pew, and we're still kind of being a little bit rambunctious at that point. And I would look over, and my dad routinely, every single Sunday, uh, from the time I have memories to being an adult, would pull out the hymnal in front of him, and he would just read hymns. And... It was his way of quieting his heart, and I asked him later on, um, you know, we would see him doing this every single Sunday, and um, it was his way of realizing why it is that he comes to church. It was setting his focus. And so today I wanted to start today's service um, with reading a hymn. Now the interesting thing about this role up here is I had a plan to read uh, one of my favorite hymns, which is Be Thou My Vision. And this morning I woke up and different words came into my brain out of nowhere at eight o'clock this morning. And it was immortal, invisible, God only wise. How many of you have heard this hymn before? Many hands, yeah, many hands. Um, I have no idea where it came from. It just popped into my brain. And I believe that, that, that these are the words that God wants you to hear this morning. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains, high soaring above, thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, then wither and perish, but not changeth, changeth thee. Thou reignest in glory, thou dwellest in light. Thine angels adore thee, all veil their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. When I think of who wrote this, I, the thought that comes to mind is he is making something known about God. And it made me ask the question, what do we make known? Our mouths make known many things, for good or for worse. Um, and it made me think, when we have an opportunity to open our mouths, when we have an opportunity to speak to one another, um, to interact, what is it that we're making known? To write a hymn like this, you have to know your God. And I think, can, could I? Could I have written this hymn? Um, and I think here we are together in church and we have the opportunity 
to know Christ a little bit deeper through the, sing, through the songs we're about to sing, uh, through the preaching, we're choosing to see if God is going to make known something to us. And it's my prayer that that then translates to what we choose to make known throughout the week. What are you going to make known today? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much that we can be here. I thank you that we have the opportunity to sit and stand in your presence. Lord, you are with us. You are with us always. And sometimes we need that moment to quiet our minds and quiet our hearts, to to hear what it is that you're trying to make known to us. Lord, we live in a post-Christian society where not much is made known about you. And we can sit here and absorb information about you. But Lord, to make known means that our hearts are open. And we pray that our hearts would be open today for this next hour and this time that we have um, together, that you would reveal yourself to us in a radical way. And so Lord, we commit this time to you. We ask for eyes to see and hearts to just be open. And we praise your name in this house. Let our mouths make known the glory of you this morning as we sing and as we listen to the preaching. We commit this morning to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to church. Please stand. song again 
Psalm 59 says, I will sing about your strength, O God. I will celebrate because of your love. You are my fortress, my place of protection in times of trouble. I will sing your praises. You are my mighty fortress, and you love me. God loves you. God is your fortress. God is your protection. Let's sing about that now.
days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God I'd Sing all my life so grateful there's our reason and we lift your name in Jesus name and all God's people said amen please be seated
It's so powerful to stand here. Um, I came up a moment too early, and I don't regret it one bit because I had I hearing hearing you all repeat those verses that all your life, you know, all all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good. To hear a crowd of people sing those words and to make that known. And I'm standing here just receiving it. I, I, I do not regret coming up here early. That was one of the best blessings I could have experienced this morning. I just, I just need a moment. <laughs> Thank you, worship team. Some of them are gone now. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so great to be led in worship this morning. This is the part of the service. Uh, where we like to share with you our giving back moment. Um, So this is a moment in the service where we share with you how your money is being used. When you tithe to the church, uh, a portion is set aside and it goes to outreach. And uh, we have a team here called Just Right. And this team assesses needs that come in and they allocate the funds appropriately. And how they hear about needs in the community is through you. So it might be a neighbor uh, that you know who's going through a hard time. It might be a coworker. Um, But it's that direct connection to you, our Grace people. And this story, uh, so the Just Right team recently learned that a disabled immigrant single mom of four uh, experienced a flood in their subsidized housing. When When I saw the description, I don't want to just ramble those words off. I want you to think about what that means to be a disabled immigrant, single mom of four. One of those descriptions carries so much weight to it. And here they are living in subsidized housing and they had a flood and they were sleeping on the damp floor. I don't know the circumstances as to why they were sleeping on the damp floor, but that's what what was happening. So a social worker um, has been working to get them into a more suitable place to live. Uh, But as a church, we learned about this. And um, we were able to provide fresh sheets and bedding for this family, along with beds for the four kids and and the mom. Um, I, 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 I can't... Thinking of that happening, like this stuff happens in our, in our city, you know, where people experience these things and to know that we have a hand to helping them feel a little bit more loved or a little bit more cherished is just so powerful. Um, so you are doing good work. If you want to join us on mission here at Grace, um, you can learn all, all about the different ways uh, to give uh, on our website at gracecommunity.ca forward slash give. Um, and it's a great way to, to be a part of good stuff that's happening, and it's a way of showing God's love in the city. Grace Kids, it is time for you to head to your program. So first, we are going to have the preschool cohort exit uh, out the back doors, and Nina is at the back doors. Nina's waving. Hello. Uh, So preschool kids, we'll just give you a moment to head on out. Wonderful. And elementary kids, are you ready? Are you ready to go? You can go now. (laughs) That's great. All right, we are so happy to welcome Pastor Mark Anderson to our church this morning. I just want to note that Pastor Mark Anderson will be doing a four-week sermon series for us, and that is such a blessing. We are so grateful to have someone come to do a four-week series. Um, So can we just give a round of applause to Mark for sacrificing to come here? Mark, you can come on up. Mark, uh, we know Mark from Royal City Mission, and um, he's one of the pastors there, and we've had the delight of getting to know him a bit over the last year and a bit um, through our time when we were having services there, and we're just grateful that you're here with us, Mark. Morning. It's good to be here with you guys. I... Um I'll tell you, I've never been called a pastor more in one sitting than this morning. 
maybe we're a bit more irreverent or I'll say, I don't know, but we just, it's not normal for us. It's not our normal lingo. I think the other thing is, I'll be, so a bit about myself, because um, reality is, is most of you don't know anything about me other than the fact that I live in Guelph, or you assume I live in Guelph, uh, and I, I really don't know anything about you, all right? So uh, that anything I say this morning, you can discount it with that, quali that qualifier right there. If you don't like it, that's fine. And I also, I just want you to know that I don't take personal offense. If you disagree with me, awesome. Run with it. That's okay. We're allowed to actually disagree as the body of Christ here together. And that's, there's actually can be some good friction and some growth in that for everybody in that. But my, myself, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was actually a pastor. And I think um, when people call me Pastor Mark, it freaks me out a bit still. Even though I've been doing this for a number of years, uh, it freaks me out because I have that baggage, right? I have the baggage of being a uh, a pastor's kid. It also means that I'm probably, I am a bit irreverent when it comes to the church because I grew up in it. I saw everything behind the scenes that went on. Uh, and we all, if you've been around the church, you know, sometimes it can get a little ugly, right? So imagine being exposed to that when you're a young child, right? That's part of the deal is growing up as a pastor's kid. So you, there is that. So if anything I say feels like callous, irrelevant, ir irreverent, yeah, just, it's part of, um, it's part of who I am a bit, so, um, but at the same time, you can dismiss it, or you can come talk to me about it. I'd love that element of that. Uh, and so for the next four weeks, my hope is that we're going to visit four different parables, and my hope is that in this time together, uh, we can uncover some fresh thinking, some new perspectives. And that's, that's the thing I think I love the most about any scripture, but the parables in particular, when you revisit things at different points in your life, different things become evident. And it's like, oh my word, how did I miss that word my entire life? And all of a sudden, it's the word, the specific word in the story that jumps out and speaks to you. And for me, I, when I return to the parables, I find this over and over and over again. I'm drawn into a new character, into a new perspective, and it sticks with me. And so my hope is that this will be that for some of you. And if it doesn't resonate with you, if you're like, this is just awful, just, just garbage, trust that the Spirit spoke to somebody else this morning. Right? I know it's shocking that it's actually not all about you. Uh, <laughs> good, good, you guys laugh. That's excellent. That's excellent. And I'll groan, laugh. If there's things you're like, oh, I don't know. It's okay, react. We'll, we'll work through this together, all right? So I want to I wanna start off this series. I want to go to the, the, the parable of the sower. And the, the parable of the sower is sometimes called the parable about parables. It's the beginning. Um, it's the first parable that Jesus gives in almost in the three gospels, which include parables. The gospel of John John decided not to include any parables for whatever reason. Um, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is one of the first ones. And it's unique in that Jesus offers an interpretation. Uh, so most of the time, Jesus is like, parable, mic drop, and moves on. Right? For the parable of the sower, he's just like, I'm going to walk this through for you guys. And so we're going to... And sometimes that makes it a bit hard because you feel like Jesus takes all the mystery out of it. Uh... But I think, and I will get to this, but I think sometimes in his interpretation, he actually makes it more complicated uh, and more tricky in some ways. But anyways, let's dive in. I want to I read this together. So it's Matthew 13. We're going to be starting at verse 1, and we'll be reading from the NIV this morning if you want to follow along. And we're just going to read to verse 9, which is just the parable itself, and then we're going to pause, going to do a bit of unpacking of context, and then we'll jump back into and read his interpretation. So, that same, Jesus, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. And while all the people stood on shore, he told them many different things in parables. Saying, a farmer went out to sow his, to sow his seed. 
As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and, cho- which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So in the, just to unpack kind of the context a bit, in the lead up to this parable, so if you look back in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is in the midst of several conflicts with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, I'm sure most of you know, but just in case, they're, so they're a religious, religious sect of, of Judaism, right? And so they're, they're some of the leaders, uh, particularly in the synagogues, they didn't, uh, they weren't the people within Jerusalem, those would have been the Sadducees, but particularly in the synagogues, in, in, the, in the rural country, the Pharisees were the ones who kind of held the weight and the... Uh, the clout, I guess. Okay, they had the power. And in chapter 12, Matt, Jesus had had a couple of different conflicts with these religious leaders, right? With the Pharisees. And in, in 12 verse 14, you actually see that the Pharisees have had enough and they start to plot the death of Jesus, right? He had openly, and they actually openly accused him of working for Satan. So it's not like they're just not getting along, Right? There's some serious uh, conflict between, the, between Jesus and the Pharisees. And in the midst of this, you also see that Jesus begins to have a bit of a following out, falling out with his own family. Uh, at the end of chapter 12, he has that, that famous, well, who, who are my brothers? Who, are, who is my mother? Right? And so you start to see that Jesus is, is starting to rub people the wrong way with his message. Right? Um, and it's at this moment, so he's, he's starting to have this conflict, but at the same time, the crowds, the people, are still with Jesus. They're following him, right? And so there's this crowd, this significant crowd, that Jesus feels like he has to go out in a boat. And I love how it's the reverse of how we do it today. So we often think that Jesus was up there and everybody was sitting on the grass, but actually everybody was standing on shore and Jesus was sitting on the boat, it tells us. Wish I had a seat. would be nice. Um, but a different picture, right? And so Jesus is with this crowd, and they're still kind of with him, and he tells them this parable. And he, it's, he's preaching it from a boat, but it's earthy. And Jesus did this. With parables, he pulled out things that people would understand, people, things that people had interaction with on an everyday basis. And for the most part, people were subsistent farmers on one level or another. People knew what it meant to have to grow their own food. So this would have been a normal practice for many people at this time. So Jesus tells this, this parable, and then he, he actually proceeds to tell them a few more. And by the end of chapter 13, uh, you actually have Jesus being cast out of his own town. So that's when he, he returns to Galilee, uh, in Nazareth, and is cast out because the people there have rejected him. And it's not because they specifically hear this parable, but this is the beginning of, you can see, Jesus' conflict. Jesus starts to teach in parables, and then Jesus is completely rejected. So you, you see this kind of over, overarching arc. And as I said, the parable of the sower is unique because it offers an interpretation to the disciples. And the Interpretation focuses on the reception of the seed by the various types of soil, right? And their, their various, their responses to the word of the kingdom. And I want, just read this, this interpretation now. And we skip a little bit in the middle. Um, I'm skipping it, not because it's not important. So there's this part where Jesus quotes Isaiah. That's a fun rabbit trail, but we're actually not going to go there this morning. Um, but we're going to skip to the interpretation. So if you're reading this whole thing through, 
um, I know I missed a bit. So starting at verse 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the words and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. You've got these four hearers, and there's actually there's a couple, there's a couple of like academic theologians who are just like, this shouldn't be called the sower. It should be called the soil or the hearers because they're actually kind of the focus of the story in some way. Um, but you've got these four soils. You've got this hard, so- hard soil, the path. You've got the rocky, shallow soil. You've got the thorny soil, and you've got the good soil. And if you look through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to try to stick within the Gospel of Matthew just for ease, you can find examples of each of these. Right? There, there are those in Matthew who hear the word of the kingdom and do not understand the path. Particularly, I think of the religious leaders who Jesus is in conflict with, right? Um, The Pharisees. Not all of them, because there's hope even in their midst, but many of them are hostile. They're closed off to the teachings of Jesus, to his word. But why do you think they are hostile? I think that's an interesting, but often the Pharisees, we give them a bad rap, right? They're just like Pharisees, idiots. They just didn't get it. But you know, they actually had pretty good reason for, uh, for thinking and reacting the way they did. You see, uh, Jesus wasn't what they were expecting. They had spent years studying scripture, okay? They knew their scripture way better than any of us. Okay. And they, had, they were convinced that the Messiah who was coming would be a militaristic leader who would raise the Jewish people to greatness and prominence in the land. That's what they were looking for, right? And do you guys know what a litmus test is? So like it, it, this test that they do, in, you do it in science class and like grade 10 biology or something where you dip a special piece of paper and it tells you whether a solution is acidic or alkaline, right? So in, this was their litmus test of a good leader versus, or a good potential messiah and a bad potential messiah. Are you coming to raise the Jewish people to greatness? Yes or no? No, obviously a bad messiah. Okay, we don't want you. And we do this exact same thing today, right? In the church, we have tons of litmus tests. If you've been around for a bit, you know that we, we ask people the question to find out where they are theologically on a certain issue, and this is the issue, are you in or are you out, right? And I think we all, there, there's a number of them, um, and so to not cause too much, much division, I won't go into details, but one that... Um, like I, when I was growing up, was in the church. It was the question of women in ministry. Do you believe that women can lead? And all of a sudden, it was like, are you in or are you out? Do you believe the Bible in its uh, its entirety, or do you like to pick and choose? Was the thinking? I'm not actually saying that's what it is, right? But that was what what the church would do, and it was this quick question. Today we talk about LGBTQ. Where do you stand on that? And the church decides very quickly, are you in or are you out, right? Most recently, too, because of some of the, uh, the Christian literature that has been written about hell, we ask people, do you believe hell is a real place? Yes or no? Because 
your answer decides if you're in or you're out. So, and the, we do this all the time, okay? And the, the Pharisees did this to Jesus. This is what they did. They asked him, are you going to raise the Jewish people to greatness? And Jesus, over and over, talks about a universal salvation. He talks about all people. And they're not hearing the words that they need to hear from Jesus. They're not saying, hearing the raising up of the Jewish people to rule over this abundant land. Right? And so they have dismissed Jesus with good reason by their own standing. Right? The litmus test of the time for the listeners was the evaluation of the Jews, and Jesus was giving a message that included the entire world. Even in this, uh, Jesus doesn't say that the Jewish people will be the good soil. Right? And by skirting the issue, you ever notice whenever uh, someone doesn't talk about what they're supposed to, you know that they're, they're avoiding it? Jesus was specifically avoiding this, I think, because he knew if I give them what they want, they're going to misinterpret it. But Jesus was saying that the seed in this wasn't just for Israel, it was going to all people. And then many of the re- religious leaders ended up rejecting Jesus because of this. And I think that's, that's a classic hard path reception. Jesus is teaching them. Like I, I think about, I'm always moved by the Beatitudes, which is prior to this. So he's gone through the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. He's given this, this beautiful word to people. but they're un- uncomfortable with it because it doesn't pass their test. So they've got their, their hard-packed soil. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, and I, I'm guilty of this all the time, we're not much different, right? As a church, I said like we're guilty of having our own litmus tests um, that are largely irrelevant and unfair. Um, but even on a personal level, right, we get an idea in our head and we make it the thing. We become overly rigid about it, and we, we begin to alienate people around us. To bec- and we become this hard-packed dirt path, unreceptive to the ideas and words of Jesus. We get stuck in our ways. Hmm. Then we move on from there, and we have the rocky, shallow soil. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. There's there's ample evidence of, of people behaving this way throughout the Gospel of Matthew the crowds, the masses of people who are currently, as Jesus is giving this, this, this parable, are currently gathered on the beach or the waterfront just to hear it, shortly are screaming for his crucifixion. They flip-flopped, right? When the trouble came, when persecution came, when the religious leaders uh, prompted them, The joy at hearing the words of Jesus wasn't matched by deep roots in the teaching. And they fell away. Right? I know for me, this was the experience of my youth. All right? I told you earlier, I grew up in the church. I'd go to a youth event. I'd have a joyous, wonderful experience. I'd come home useless, unproductive, not really much change in my life. And then I'd do it again and again. And again, it was quite the roller coaster. At least three times a year, you had to go to a youth event because it was the only way you could ever hold on to your faith, right? Right. Some of you know. Some of you know you've been this. Oh, and the reality, like, don't. The reality is, is sometimes this is what gets us through. Okay. There, I don't discount it because many of those experiences meant a lot to me and still do. All right. 
Uh, but they also won't sustain you. Okay? I, I behaved like shallow soil. And I get from the laughter that some of you have as well in the past. See, I would go and you'd have this joyous experience or you'd have this like supernatural movement where you just feel the presence, right? Even this morning, like the music. Here, listening to you guys sing, it was beautiful, right? It was supernatural. There's a moment, you get chills. You're just like, yeah, this is awesome. There's joy in that. But unfortunately, as much as those are beautiful, if that is your, all it is, when the crap hits the fan in our life, there's just not going to be enough of that to sustain you. See, when I was younger, I didn't know how to or I was unwilling to do the work of putting down sustaining roots. So the seeds of Jesus' message in my own life, they couldn't be sustained. And I love this imagery. Often, and millennials get a bad rap for this. I'm a millennial, so I'm going to be harsh on you guys, right? Uh, we want the, the job that took 40 years for everybody else to get right off the bat, right? Uh, and I think millennials are, are known for this, but I just want boomers, you were known for this when you came around the first time, so there's still hope for us, okay? Is we want to look like giant oaks without doing the work of putting down roots. And two things happen in that moment, in, in, when that happens, because the reality is, is troubles will come. It's inevitable. Troubles will come. And if you haven't done the work of putting down deep roots, you have two options. One, you can wither and die. Or two, you can settle for being a stunted bush. Right? Those are your options. And I, I can tell you from my own experience growing up in, in, the, in the faith, I went through both. For most of my, uh, my youth, I settled for being a stunted bush. Um, not to say that I'm a great giant oak of faith, my word. So much work still to do, right? But the, this is the, uh, the shallow, rocky soil. Next we have the thorny soil, right? There's this seed that falls among thorns. Someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The, the most striking example, and I do this with a bit of hesitance to, to name one person in, in scripture, but... The rich young ruler is a beautiful picture or a striking picture of this, right? He comes to Jesus and asks, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Like, I've been listening to you speak and I am moved, right? He's had the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the presence of Jesus sown into his life. He wants something to do with it. Jesus looks at him and says, you just need to go sell everything you own. And then you can come and follow me with your entire heart. And his reaction is just the opposite of the soil before. He walks away sad. The deceitfulness of wealth choked out the teachings of Jesus in his life. And I think this is a good place to note, I've often heard when we talk about these soils, okay, I often heard this one is, see the thorns that choked out the life? Be careful of the company you keep. Right? That was what it was interpreted to me as, is the people you are, who are around you are the people who are going to, to choke it out. But Jesus actually isn't saying this. He actually identifies the weeds that are the most destructive Worry and wealth. And this, is, like, this should concern us, okay? This should worry us, that Jesus identifies worrying and wealth. One, we're all fairly well off. Living in Canada makes us well off, all right? We are the wealthy. Even the poorest amongst us are relatively wealthy. We live in the midst of weeds, 
And they aren't people. They're ideas. They're ideas that wealth and worry will help us, will save us. Right? And I, for me, working at Royal City, people often, we surround ourselves with some interesting characters, all right? And I tell you, when people come in and they treat them like thorns, I'd not much gets me more frustrated because we miss that God loves them, right? That there's beauty in the midst of them and we miss the presence of God in those other people. So if you ever think about using this parable as judgment on someone and being like, hard path, thorny soil, right? Do so, or do so with caution. There's a theologian, a Catholic theologian, Robert Capon, he talks about, he, he unpacks the parables and he calls them about, he, un, he categorizes them grace, uh, judgment, and mercy, I think is the last one. Anyways, this is a parable about grace, not a parable about judgment. And so that's an interesting, when you, when you read this parable, to come at it with this, this idea of grace. So we've got thorny soil, the presence of worry and wealth. And then lastly, you've got the good soil. Those who hear the word and understand it. Those who produce a crop. Those who hear and understand, those who hear and live it out. That's, that's what understanding means when Jesus is talking about understanding. It's not, a cog- it's not saying I assent cognitively to that idea, right? It isn't saying I, even I agree with our lips and our mind only. It's more than that. It's taking it and making it a part of your life. So those who hear and understand are those who hear and actually live it out. And it seems when you look in the Gospel of Matthew that these would be the hardest to identify. The 12 disciples, or 11 I guess after Judas, eventually react like good soil. They eventually put themselves like they hear and they understand and we actually get to see the crop that they produce. I find it interesting, also in Matthew though, that Jesus tells the chief priests and the elders, the religious leaders of the day, that just so you know, tax collectors, prostitutes, are going to go in the kingdom of God ahead of you. Just so you know, Religious leaders. The despised ones, the ones that society has rejected, they're going to behave like good soil well before any of you. The, The people of society and the religious institutions, the respected people, who by all rights should be good soil, and we would probably want to identify as good soil, Jesus says that they'll miss it. I'm a religious leader. This is terrifying. (laughs) Right? And often we think, well, don't worry, they were the Pharisees. We're different. Right? We've got it all together. We know what's going on. But I don't think so. It's interesting. So the disciples themselves, they wouldn't have been first picks in society. When Jesus goes and he picks the disciples, most of the people would have said, Jesus, I think you can find some better soil. Right? And when Jesus does this, he actually goes through and he he tells all these parables. And afterward, he says to them, have you understood everything I've taught you? To which the disciples respond, yes, of course, we get it. They have heard. But as soon as Jesus is gathered up for crucifixion, what happens? They abandon him. 
they, they demonstrate again and again throughout the, the, the Gospels that they just don't get it. And ultimately, they leave the side of Jesus. So even those who we think would be obvious picks for good soil seem to miss it. But what is remarkable is that, that in spite of these failings, Jesus doesn't give up on his disciples. And this is what... So, this is what leads us to the namesake of the parable, the sower. And there's theologians who, or academic writers who would be like, really, this is about soil, and that we should be writing, we should have called this the, the parable of the four soils. And I respectfully disagree. Because this character makes all the difference. The sower scatters seed, the sower scatters seed carelessly, recklessly. He doesn't seem to worry about where it's going to land. Right? Some would say it's even wasteful. 25% of the seeds that he sows are successful. If you like numbers, that's a terrible return. But at the same time, I want you to know that this is fantastic news for us. You know, that Jesus will sow seed in our life despite our initial reaction. You know, as a church, I think uh, we tend to value uh, stingy, strategic planting. We spend a lot of time trying to identify good soil. We make that our mission. So we got to find some good soil. And then we'll plant our seed that Jesus has given us to get plant. And what is so beautiful and freeing is that Jesus does just the opposite. And he continues to do just the opposite. He invested in his disciples who continually looked unpromising. He squandered his time with tax collectors and sinners and lepers and the demon-possessed. He spent his time with outcasts, with those whose society had pushed away, continuing to sow seed amongst them despite everything to the contrary. This is good news. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves... We can probably find evidence of several, if not all, four soils within our own life. Right? And not just our own life as a whole. Like, I I talked about how definitely in my younger years, I was shallow, rocky soil. But the reality is, is I think on a daily basis, I find evidence of hard-packed, resistant path in my life. I find evidence of rocky, shallow soil where there's moments of joy and then just utter failure. I find evidence where wealthy weeds win the day. And I'm thankful for daily evidence that the good soil exists within my own life. That there's evidence of life and a receptiveness to the teachings of Jesus. If there's any hope for this unproductive soil, is that the sower keeps sowing generously and extravagantly, even the least promising of places. Because the reality is, is if you think yourself good soil, right there, you're already on a hard-packed surface. Jesus' investment in his disciples shows us that he simply will not give up on them in spite of their many failings, and he simply will not give up on us. The song we sang earlier, that you guys sang so beautifully, the goodness of God, all my life, you have been faithful. This is about the faithfulness of God. When we read this this parable, it's not about identifying and pointing to and judging. It's about gratefulness that God sows into our life despite our response. The Pharisees, who identified as obviously hard-packed, Ground. There was hope even amongst them. 
Nicodemus is one of those Pharisees who ends up helping provide a resting place for the body of Jesus, even though he only needed it a short time. Nicodemus didn't know that, right? We trust that God will not give up on us. That he'll keep working on whatever is hardened, whatever is shallow, whatever is thorny within and among all of us. As a church, we trust in God's promise and Jesus' promise to continue to be with us. I think too often the church today, and I'm not pointing fingers at grace, I'm saying the church as a whole, Royal City, we do this too. We, we spend so much time just sowing the word where we're confident we will be well received. We only look to those who we think will receive it and likely become contributing members of our congregations, regular tithers. We focus on evaluating and judging soil more than we do on seeking out the evidence of fruit in people's lives. This is another fun fact. So the seed is already sown. So it's all around us already. So sometimes we get this idea that we have to be the people who are doing the sowing. There's, there is pieces of that. But even more than that, there's the, evident, there's the reality that as followers of Jesus, we are finding the seed that has been sown into our own lives, but also in the world around us. When we hold on to our energy and our resources tightly, we miss the opportunity to lean into this. Right? We, we stifle creativity and energy that God has given people for reaching others, for bringing out the good news of Jesus. Because we're afraid of making a mistake. I love that three out of four attempts by the sower were failures. Not that I think there's anything, I don't think we need to think about it that way. We have to tell four people about Jesus so that one sticks. Uh, it's not so much like that. It's the reality that failure will be a part of it, and we can be okay with that. We can embrace failure, just as Jesus did, and approach this with the freedom to take risks, the freedom to endorse extravagant generosity, to sow the seed and find the seed in perilous and unlikely places. When we think about soil and focusing on good soil, we miss. We miss that God wants us either to sow seed extravagantly or to identify fruit. The last piece of this is the, the seed grew and there was a crop. There's produce. We often, even today, we evaluate people, we judge people based on their soil versus the evidence of Jesus in their life. And I, there isn't much better list than, than this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, good news, faithfulness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. And it's often tempting to look for good soil instead of good fruit. But I think when we miss and focus on soil, we miss it. And we miss the generosity of our Creator. Let's just close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your generous and extravagant sowing in our lives and in this world. You know, there's many who would decry it as foolishness. 
But in that, we praise you just with so much thankfulness. Soften our hearts so we can receive your life. Deepen, deepen our roots so we can withstand hard times. And strengthen us to stand up to the temptation of wealth and worry. Teach us to receive your word, your presence in our lives in such a way as to produce fruit that is honoring to you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
What a beautiful morning. What a beautiful morning we've had together. I want to just thank the worship team this morning and our tech team at the back. Um, yes, let's, that's a clap. <laughs> you, you might not know this, but they practice in the week. Uh, they come on Thursday, sometimes Friday night. Uh, so they sacrifice a, a weekday to be here to practice. And it's often not just an hour, it's more than that. And they come early here on Sunday mornings at 7.30. And so it's everyone you see up here, plus other members, we have different members on the team that cycle through. And our tech at the back, they're doing exactly the same thing. Um, and it's just worth noting uh, because it it is so special to have a morning like we did this morning. Uh, you can take a seat for a moment. I have a few announcements for you. Um, we're going to be having coffee hour outside here, so we'll be exiting uh, the auditorium doors. And uh, you most may, maybe you didn't have a chance, but if, if you would like our new uh, November bulletin, you can grab one just on the table here. As well, if you're new and you're joining us today for the first time, we do have a welcome package as well on that table. Feel free to grab that. You can learn all about how to join our mailing list um, and get uh, some more information on how to get plugged in. Um, Grace Youth, we will have a two-week hiatus, so there will be no Grace Youth this coming Wednesday as well as November 10th, and that is because uh, we have a new youth pastor starting uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, work. He'll be starting work, um, and his name is Peter Gibson, and we are so excited to welcome him to church. You'll, you'll get to meet him next week. Um, and I was just thinking if you could pray for him this week, as we do, as our staff does onboarding and he meets with us as well, um, just getting trained and meeting our youth leaders and things like that, um, just pray for him this week. It's very exciting. Uh, pray that we don't scare him away. Um, that's a joke. We won't scare him. Well, we could, I guess. I don't, we won't scare him away. <laughs> it's all good. Brian might. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, so yeah, that's very exciting. So if you could pray for his onboarding uh, this week, that would be special to do together. Um, so now we're going to do uh, just a blessing to send you off. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all, sorry, than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us today.